every fight almost needs to be treated as its own business. Boxing is one of those sports where your career can end as quickly as it gets started. And it will end other people's careers, your whole team behind you. Absolutely. It doesn't matter what the show is three weeks down the road. We need to get through this show first. This show needs to be as big as possible. Depending on the show, there could be thousands of people involved. So now it's like, all right, well, it's coming down to what I say now into a microphone. You can have an entire team of people that are now trying to scrambling because you made a mistake on the microphone. It's kind of a chaotic industry and a chaotic sport, but because of that, it also allows it to be one of the most popular sports in the world. By night, my guest, Big Mo, is ring announcer for Boxer on Sky and NBC. By day, he is Cody Momarts, the COO of SaaS business Sports Thread. We talk about what entertainment and entrepreneurship should have in common. Spoiler, it's being engaging. Why standing out is better than fitting in, even if it means being a bit weird. Nothing wrong with that. Why it's really hard to list the skills that you really need in a job description and how, in some capacity, everything is sales when you boil it down. Cody, welcome to the podcast. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. It's, <laughs> I've, I've been watching this show for a while and I'd watched Ben's episode previously and I'm excited to do, you know, kind of a multi-tier, multi-faceted business conversation. So this is exciting for me. Lovely. And we've just learned you're from Denver, Cody, a place close to, close to my heart. Yes, apparparently you're going to we're going to have to hang out in Denver apparently more than just London. So listen, of the things that are going on in your life at the moment, uh what are you spending the most time on? Is it this sports thread and tell us more about it? Mm -hmm. Uh it's a mixture of both. Um I would say in Denver, I'm the COO of a company called Sports Thread. It's a software company that I've been with basically since inception. I was a college football player, played at the University of Northern Colorado where I got my undergrad and my masters. At the time, I had a teammate named Keenan Leary, who's now the CIO of Sports Thread. His older brother is Sean Leary, who's the CEO and founder, and he told me at the time when we were 18 living in the dorms that his brother had an idea for a company. And so I kind of just helped out where I could just in the very very beginning, maybe even before it was officially a company, it could have been an idea at that point for all I know. But uh, ever since we've been able to grow and now we're a software that's used by almost 200 different companies across the world. We're launching a new piece of our technology here soon. We actually just launched in the United Kingdom, have a full employment staff and three quarters of a million users that are on the platform. So it's been an amazing journey. So that takes up a good chunk of my time. And then I also am a ring announcer for combat sports. So kind of a departure, totally different thing that I do. Uh, but I like to fill my time with both and I enjoy doing both. Nice. And Sports Thread, what, what does it do? It's a marketing company or? No, it's a uh, software as a service platform mm -hmm. for uh, any, basically any sports organization, all the way from amateur, all the way to professional. Um, so we offer a suite of services, anything from registration to payment processing to age verification to ticketing to kind of everything in between for a business. Mm. And then we also have built a full service advertising network, which I have overseen. Um, so we've built a sports focused advertising network that serves as both a DSP and an SSP uh, for advertising clients and websites. Was there a gap in the market for this or why, why do you think you've set this up? Because there's lots of ticketing out there, I would assume, isn't there? Yeah. So I think, and you kind of just alluded to it, is that ticketing is one of the things that we do. What we've learned about the industry is that it's very fragmented, especially when it comes from a technology and software standpoint. You have businesses and sports organizations that could use 10, 15 different softwares to run their business functions. And we're able to basically package a lot of them together, which has been a challenge is basically unifying the market and taking a market that was used to one software for ticketing, one for payment processing, one for registration, one for bracket building or whatever we do. And now we basically brought them all together into one. Boxing is one of the few sports that actually US and the UK are, are very in, yes. you know, that we share. You know, it's actually, it's hard to come up with lots of others. I mean, football, like as no, in soccer. We, we don't share that. I well, would be honest. <laughs> it's becoming more popular, to. but yeah, yeah. It's not, I mean, an, it's been interesting. American football is here. I mean, we've just had the, what's the Chicago team called? They're, Bears. They're here at the moment. Nice. Well, they were here at the weekend because yeah. I, I half met the mayor and loads of other people here for the game and stuff. And the NFL's made a commitment to do. But other than that, you know, British sport, True. you know, is, is fairly separate. I mean, I would agree. Have you spent much time with the platform launching in the UK, looking at British sports and the sport, which which sports to go yeah. after? Yeah, I mean, uh, football is- Is in soccer. As, yeah. as in soccer, yeah. yeah. So football- Thank you for using the correct oh, term. It's actually a funny story, just quickly digress. <laughs> I remember the first press conference that I hosted when I was working for Sky Sports here. We did a press conference at, um, we were at the, the stadium for Liverpool FC. And I remember I referred to it as soccer. 
And I think it was the same weekend that Liverpool was playing Everton. And I remember some people from Sky pulled me over and they were like, you know, hey, just to be clear. You may be a big lad, but we're taking you down. Like, hey, if you're coming all the way over here and you're going to be a part of this, this is now like two years ago. So I've trained myself to not Uh, say it, but now I say football. But uh, for us, definitely football is the biggest market. I think it provides the most opportunity for us in our platform, whether it's anything from the youth side of what we do, because there's so many youth clubs and academies throughout this country because of the popularity of the sport. Or if it's then working with our ticketing platform at different organizations, we have a handful of options to go to. But a big reason why we just launched here is because it's a massive sports market just in the same way that the United States of America is. We're mad for it. Um, And we seem to love coming up with games. I I don't know. (laughs) I mean, it's almost one of the few things to be proud of to be British. You're kind of like so many of the sports that are well known were sort of invented by by the Brits, which is kind of strange. I mean, it's such a sort of moment in history that America, you know, also part of it finding its own identity kind of dumped all our sports. There is some really, there's some funny historical moments. There was a cricket match. You know, there used to be cricket matches between America and Britain and stuff, which Mm. seems like... So unusual now, but boxing sits in this weird little bubble and actually British boxing is like the best it's ever been. Yes. I never, when I grew up, I mean, I'm 46. I mean, you know, there was Bruno and there was uh, Lennox Lewis. He was yep. amazing, but he yep. never got any credit. I didn't think, you know, he <laughs> not, really downplayed himself. I mean, do you feel, do you feel with, when you look at boxing now and the sort of um, what's going on, I guess, I guess with British and American boxing and stuff, do you, do you, do you feel that uh, there's a, you know, this is here to stay, that British Britain's going to be properly at the table? Because I think Absolutely. America was so dominant for a long time as well. I think so. I think um, boxing is a sport and really combat sports as a whole, it's, you can't really compare it to any other sport because it's, I've always said that I think boxing and combat sports is the best sports because of all of its imperfections that it has. You know, it's very, it can be very chaotic, very disorganized. Things can change very quickly. There's no set season. There's so much drama that goes on behind the scenes. There's negotiations. Basically every event, every fight almost operates as its own business because you go from fight to fight and show to show. And it's kind of, what have you done for me recently that the market looks for? So it's kind of a chaotic industry and a chaotic Mm. sport, but Because of that, it also allows it to be one of the most popular sports in the world. And I think that it's absolutely here to stay. I think that it's getting increasingly popular. I think that boxing is seeing almost a bit of a resurgence now because of the popularity that's being driven back into the sport because we have a lot of characters right now. We have a lot of high-profile stars. Some big fights are starting to get made. I think the infrastructure is building out a little bit more. And uh, I think it's overall just really exciting. Because I guess what you're saying is you can't, plan out the whole fixtures boxing's based on all these combat sports are based on where you lose so now you don't fight all those people and you do fight these people or you know and so everything's always being sort of made up as it goes along correct and i think that that's what makes the sport amazing because a lot of other sports they have the benefit of a of a set system a set season everything is already predetermined there's long-term contracts for everything you know, it's, it's basically, it's a lot of rinse and repeat because you know the general structure of how the season's going to go. But when it comes to boxing, you have a certain fighter that loses a fight, you know, that could change their entire career, which then change the promotions goal. You maybe go from five people that could main event a show to four or 10 to nine or whatever. And ultimately your entire business gets altered just off the backs of what could be one show. And how did you get in with Boxer? I mean, what's the audition? Do you stand on the thing and (laughs) shout or how does that work? Honestly, my career has been kind of crazy how fast it's gone. Um, So I got into this very early on because I always loved entertainment and I just was always a good public speaker. I had friends that said that I should pursue sports commentary because that's a common transition. I was an American football player. So, you know, get done with my career, go commentate football. I was tired of football and basketball, played them my whole life, but I love combat sports. So I became a commentator for a local organization in Denver, saw the ring announcer, saw the MC, thought that that was maybe more my speed, picked it up, started utilizing social media and market myself as a whole. In general, the majority of ring announcers that are in the industry are a bit older than me. It is what it is. So I gained a lot of notoriety for being a lot younger, went viral quote unquote on TikTok and Instagram. There's and not things many like that. around who do it, I don't think. I mean there's, there's the very famous guy who always does the let's get ready to Michael rumble. Buffer. Michael yeah, Buffer, yeah. who's With a personal gr- favorite of mine. Yep. Yeah. And then his brother Bruce does the UFC. Big fans of both of them. Oh, are they brothers? They I didn't are. know that. Yeah, okay. It's an amazing story too. If you haven't, you know, give it a read, it's it's actually a pretty fascinating story. But uh no, there's not many. I and was, what makes a good ring announcer? Uh a lot of things. Um 
I think anything from obviously your ability to do something live and present in front of people is a skill. I think being able to condense what you say, but also be entertaining, your ability to project, your ability to set a stage, your body language is important. Basically, a lot of the tools that you would learn learning to be a public speaker, you can apply to ring announcing, but then it goes a lot deeper because it's not just public speaking. It's also public speaking with the purpose of setting a stage. It's also public speaking with the purpose of helping be the flow and the progress of an event because you're basically the, not the narrator, but you're ultimately the person that kind of helps drive the event forward and introduce different people and things like that. So there's a there's a handful of techniques. It's not, I it's don't think it's condensed. as simple as people think. I mean, it's a, but it's a great job too, because yeah. you don't have to do it for that long, do you? <laughs> it's like, I mean, you, you, it's quite condensed. You've got to get up there and change it from mumble, mumble, this is going on, that going, to be sort of like, all right, now we're going to fight. Correct. You know, Correct. it's a sort of swift of that switch of atmosphere. Almost. Yes. It's, it's to me, combat sports is the mixture of sports and entertainment because it goes a lot deeper than just the sport. And some of the most memorable moments that we have in some of the parts of boxing and combat sports that people like the most aren't even related to the sport. For example, if you ask a lot of people what their favorite part of the show is, a lot of people will say the main event ring walk where the, where the fighters get introduced and the crowd mm. is sold out and there's fireworks and pyro and music and live performances. And it's this giant show. So I think that it's fascinating that I get to work in sports but I ultimately get to really work in entertainment more than I do in sports because my job doesn't really do anything with the sport. Yes, it motivates the fighter and gets them ready to go and things like that. But as it pertains to my relationship with the audience or the consumer, it's pretty much just pure entertainment. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And and I've I, you know even though I've I've loved boxing for for a long time, you know I've never actually made it to a boxing fight. So there's a is there a much longer build up than you would ever see when they cut the fights? Is there? There's a yeah, sort of well, I mean the whole night is a build up. Yeah, and that's also what's kind of interesting too is that the way that cards are constructed, it ultimately leads to a crescendo being the main event because that's why everyone's there. They're the two names that are at the top of the top of the sheet. They're the big faces that are on the poster. Yeah. You know, you refer to the event as person versus person, this person versus that person. So it all ultimately kind of builds together, both in the way that the product is presented on television, the way that the product is presented live, each fight that leads up to it. It all, it all, excuse me, it all ultimately builds together. Yeah. And within this, um, within this job, it's sort of, you, you, is it about sort of, I mean, the, the guy who does the let's get ready to rumble, he's been saying that same thing. So that's like, if he didn't say it, everyone would be like, what, what, you say the thing, yeah. say the thing. Catch it's almost like are, a, yeah. it's almost the click moment, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. It's the cue. And, and then we're off. And then of, of, of your current taste at the moment, just off the record, who, which boxers do you love then at the moment? The bo which boxer specifically? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, all the, all the ones that I've really introduced, I've been able to build a good rapport with over here, members of the bo of the boxer stable and the overall British You need to get stable. to know them, do you? No, I just choose to. Right. I think that, that that's something that I have that may be unique to other MCs as I was – a high performing athlete. I played division one football, which is basically a step below professional in America. Which is a big deal. If that's, is that college level or is Yeah. Cause college football, there's like 50,000 people at these games. Yeah. So I think I, and also my age too, being basically the age of these boxers, I think that, uh, that ultimately kind of allows for me to become maybe closer to them and hang out with them and relate to them a little bit more. I understand when to talk to them, when not to talk to them. I understand when maybe they don't want to be approached versus, you know, they're, they're kind of free and they're post fight and relaxed and things like that. And I like to have a relationship with them because ultimately when I introduce them, it's actually a pretty intimate moment. Yeah. We're surrounded by 20 upwards of 20,000 people and however many people are watching on television, but as it relates to myself and the boxer, we're kind of just in there together in the ring together. And it's kind of an intimate moment. Do you have to, you have to write the little summary, do you, when you're like, you know, saying all everyone's, you know, all to ego names. Uh, I mean, every, every MC is ultimately different. I prefer to have my introductions not be super drawn out, like to get over the information, like to kind of get on with the show, but I like the introductions to be passionate and to be energetic and to get the crowd going. That's really what I focus on. And then you're free. You can go have a cup of tea. Well, I could, yeah. Uh, yeah. I like to you sit there and watch out. the fight. Well, you watch the fight yeah. with a cup of tea yeah. or whatever, whatever your tipple is, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. But, you know, that's that's the lovely bit. I mean, I can't, it's interesting. I struggle to think of a British ring announcer. Even when they do the big fights here, they they fly over the chap you mentioned and stuff. Is there a famous British ring announcer? Not really. Um, Not it's not really, we're not, not very good at that. Super current, I would say. Mm. And that was kind of what surprised me when Sky and Boxer reached out was 
I was like, why would a British promotion want an American? But then I learned that ultimately a lot of Brits here and a lot of Europeans look at the American accent as being the international accent. When mm. in America, obviously because I'm American, I don't look at American as the international accent. I look at British as being a more international accent. Well, quite so right too. Thank you very much for yeah. that. I think, I'm just glad we clarified <laughs> exactly. that. Exactly. Um, you know, uh, no, I think that, oh, is that interesting? One of the reasons I was just thinking the British would be a bit shit at it because, I mean, that's really unfair. We have some huge characters. I'm sure we could do it sort of thing, but the British version just wouldn't be quite, let's get ready to run, but it'd be like, okay, and we're off. And that's, and that's <laughs> kind of a joke that a lot of, you know, a lot of people within the industry make, which I guess that's, that's well, their if opinion. You, you, I mean, you won't notice this so much, but as a Brit, you notice it. you know, if you're on the tube and four people from America get on, the volume that these people talk <laughs> at, it's double what a British person would speak at, you know? That so is, we That is true. We are allowed people. You're very loud. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you're very loud. And I don't know what, you know, we're all like, we're like, will they just stop being, I mean, you could be in a restaurant sometimes and be like, my gosh, this is some Americans here. And we all get worse. We get like quieter and quieter. Like we're I passing pieces of paper. Going to be a bash on American podcast. No, no, no. <laughs> this is definitely not a no. But it's it's. But no, you're I mean, 100% it's, right. it's yeah. interesting. There's we're, something. We're, we're allowed, there's something about we're showmanship. There's, yeah. there's something about a showmanship that's like, but you know. So and, and America's very much a pizzazz country, and we like our extravagance and our big shows and the Super Bowl and all that. We love that. Watch so out for our lack of response. I went with my son to the Monster Truck uh, Monster Jam. They oh, bought yeah, they nice. bought it to London. First time they've been to London. Flew over the American announces Fleur took my son there and there were just some hilarious moments when they were obviously very rehearsed in what they did and they had all their, their, their they were hitting all their points and everything but they'd say like and now blah, 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 blah. and there'd just be silence and then just someone saying someone saying interesting or someone oh. saying quite good that's quite, quite good, good. <laughs> you know it's like I was explaining to this um, lady I met the other night who, who was from overseas and she was too she was using too many adjectives and I was like you've got to understand in Britain quite good's as good as it gets True. that's the top of the shop yeah. that is <laughs> Absolutely fan fucking tastic. You know, I'm quite, uh, when you're talking about yourself, you can, when, and she was saying, yeah, but people say um, fabulous and amazing and stuff. And I'm like, you could say that about someone else. True. You could say they're fabulous. True. You know, big, Mo, big Mo's fabulous. Thank you. You know, how am I? I mean, I'm all right. quite good. You know, quite good. That's, that's, <laughs> I'm going in high then. I'm starting high, you exactly. know? Exactly. So, I mean, the professional sports background for sure would give you a, a better depth of knowledge. I mean, did you find, you know, did you think about taking that all the way or, you know, were there opportunities to take it further or you were kind of like, oh, I've done no. division one, I'm out. <laughs> when I, when I was done, I was done. Um, truthfully, I don't even think I was probably good enough to play in the pros. And I'm honest enough with myself to say that, but I also, I was a better student than I was a football player. I really liked school, uh, both mm. at the undergraduate and the graduate level. So I was focusing a lot on that, especially towards the tail end of it. So by the time my career was over, I was pretty much done. And the concussion is issues you get in American football are the, sa are the same. I mean, they, they, these boxes get, you know, it could be fairly severe. Yeah. I mean, that must be, as far as I understand it, American football is one of those sports that's like, you will get those problems if you keep going. Right. The common thing is that they say that football is a contact sport. It's not. It's a collision sport. It's very different. Mm. Basketball is a contact sport. There is contact. Football is high-speed Collisions. Car accidents, basically. With cars. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, it just, people, I mean, your, your analogy is well said, you yeah. know, um, someone coming at you like that. Okay. Very good. So then you step into it and you have these two avenues in your life. That's pretty cool. I mean, what, what, you know, have you got a long-term plan you want to try and get to or? Yeah. I mean, you know, when it comes, I guess on the, the ring announcing and entertainment side, I, I would love to see, I've been able to see my career go into different realms of entertainment. I've gotten to be a host and host different events and live events. I've been able to do a little bit of acting, which is fun. And hopefully I can pursue those more heavily at some what point. What kind of acting? What part do you play? Uh, I was actually, unfortunately my scene got cut, but I was in the Hulu TV show for Mike Tyson. So I oh, got no to way. Flew, out, flew out and did that. I actually thought I got cast as Michael Buffer, oddly enough, but I didn't. I was just kind of more of a generic type of host, radio host. Oh, bastards cussing your scene. Yeah. <laughs> it's so annoying when that happens. Yeah, so I've gotten to do a little bit of acting, which is cool, and hopefully I can pursue more of that when time permits. Um, so that's kind of on the entertainment side. But then on the sports side and the business side, it's, you know, I'm committed to growing the company and, to, and thinking where we can lead it and where we can take it to become a leader in the industry. And I want to see that obviously happen too. And I'm someone that 
I like to commit to things, especially when I really want to commit my time to it. I want to see it through and I'm in the middle of seeing two things through. Yeah. Nice. I mean, you, you, everyone seems to do multiple things these days, but yeah, you still need to really focus on them. Like you can do more than one thing, but Certainly. you know, you've definitely got to give whatever it is time and yes. practice it. Like, you know, a ring announcer is a classic one of those jobs that you could probably learn the basics quite quickly, but being really good at it, That's that takes I, a long time. I've always, what I've said to people is if I was to put up a job posting for a ring announcer, it would look very simple. The, the, there wouldn't be a lot to it. However, when you dive into the technical side of it and actually want to be proficient at it and how you want to take it and how you want to advance it past just the bare minimum requirements of doing the job, that's where it becomes complex. And that's why the industry, when you look at professional MCs or ring announcers that actually travel and make a career out of it and actually do it full time, there's maybe 15 to 20 well, you in the can't whole world? fuck it up excuse my friend no, seriously you and, can't. and and i don't care who you are like you know i rap a bit and stuff you know if you if yeah. you you know as a friend said to me years ago great advice is that um you know it's not hard doing it as long as you practice yes. you know and then the adrenaline takes over but you can't get up there and get tongue-tied or nope. mess up a word i mean i i did it badly i'm you know as a dyslexic reading intros and getting words right and names right yeah. that's a nightmare it's uh, where the MC or the ring announcer has a unique job is we or I am the only person part of the show that speaks to both the in arena crowd and the crowd that's watching at home. Uh, otherwise it's separated. Correct. Otherwise commenta commentators just talk to the TV crowd. Really. There's not a whole lot of people that talk to the whole arena. Maybe there's, maybe there's a PA announcement every now and then, but as a whole, I'm the only person that talks to both groups. So then I not only have to think about public speaking to a forum, to an audience of people, but I also have to think about how can I be engaging to X amount of people that are watching on television because the experience is going to be different for both of them. So yeah. I not only have to sound a certain way, I have to maybe look a certain way or have body movement in a certain way or engage the camera in a certain way. And these are the more technical sides of the job that, like I was saying, if there was a job posting, you wouldn't really be able to explain all that. No. But this is a deeper, deeper side of the job that people may not recognize. And then when you compound that with now I'm representing a business, now I'm representing a network. I've been handed a microphone that's I can say whatever I want. I can mess up. I can whatever. I have to be completely dialed and I have to deliver the messages that I have to deliver, whether it's plugging an advertiser, whether it's introducing a fighter, whether it's taking a cue from a commercial break and the amount of people that are involved in the production. I mean, when you look at it on a global scale, depending on the show, there could be thousands of people involved. Mm. There could be hundreds of people involved. So now it's like, all right, well, it's coming down to what I say now into a microphone. If I mess up or if I misread something or if I introduce the wrong person, knock on wood, I've never done that, it could throw the whole thing out of whack. And you could have an entire <sighs> team of people that are now trying to scrambling because you made a mistake on the microphone. Oh my God. And you must, the name would be the thing that would scare me. <laughs> there must be some boxes names that come along. You're like, oh, come on. I was That's actually one of my favorite parts. Yeah. Really? Uh, yeah. I love unique Complicated. names. And, yeah. Because I, I'm someone that I'm good with phonetics. Okay. So I never try to spell them. I never try to read them how they're spelled. But if I can hear them, and that's all I need. Mm. So I always kind of like when there's a unique name because it allows for a little bit of, you know, something different with the job. If everyone's guy's name was Mike Smith, no disrespect to Mike Smith's out there, but if everyone's name was Mike Top Smith. Top boxer, Mike Smith. Yeah, it wouldn't exactly be the most, you know, crazy introduction, I guess. And it makes sense, the accent actually, because the US accent is more understood globally because of American films, because it's more American. That's a good point. You know, that, I mean, the, that, the, and, and your job is so important to be clear, you know? I mean, yeah. that's the most important thing. It's like, I need to understand what you're saying when you're saying it, Correct. you know? Um, what do you think in, I mean, we, we need to do this from maybe a couple of different angles, but, you yeah. know, the biggest pr problem may be facing the industry of boxing, maybe? Well, oddly enough, I actually think that the issues, there's actually kind of similarities between both the tech and the boxing when it comes to this question. Because I think one issue or one thing that I have to be cognizant of is the speed at which the industries move. Um, so in boxing, things change all the time. Beyond just us being a live show, there's constantly things throughout the week that go wrong. There's constant changes or there's constant adjustments or timing changes or, oh, well, this person actually needs X, Y, Z read about them or this person you know, is out of the fight and we're finding a fill in or things like there's always stuff going on because it ultimately is a ton of effort dedicated by a team all for basically one night of action. 
right? So there's so many things going into that, that there's also so many things that can go wrong with that. Mm. The industry moves very quickly. And those subs, yes. I mean, really. For the most part, no. So you always need to have adjustments ready. Ultimately, the same kind of logic also applies to technology and sports because that industry changes quickly also. You always have new competitors coming in. You always have new businesses coming in. You have pre-existing technologies that are rolling out new features or new things that they can do. So there's always this constant battle for the same amount of clients, the same amount of organizations that would utilize technology, but you have so many players coming into the market now and so many advances in technology that you have to be able to move quickly to keep up. Yeah. I mean, the change of, the change of um, pace is just ridiculous these days. I mean, so one, one is really, you know, in terms of the boxing industry evolving and then in terms of sports technology having to change, you know, incredibly fast. I mean, it's the stuff that you think is bullshit in boxing, you know? There's bullshit in every industry. I'll yeah. be the first one to say that. So it kind of just depends on what, you know, what gets brought up. But I'm sure there is. Yeah. What's the biggest bullshit then or something you, you it would be good to change, do you think, at all in boxing? Has anything crossed your mind like that? We've seen it recently start to change, um, but I think teamwork and unification within the market would be very helpful. What does that mean? So in boxing, a big reason why the industry of boxing is complex is because you have a ton of different stakeholders and businesses that all have to operate together for it to work. Mm -hmm. So for example, you have a promotion, you have, you have X amount of promotions, you have X amount of broadcasters, you have X amount of governing bodies, you have X amount of sanctioning bodies, you have X amount of boxers, each with their own management team that are also part of their promotional teams. So there's this constant shuffling of resources in the industry. And if even one or two of them don't get along or can't reach an agreement, the whole apple cart could be upset and the whole house could come down. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you're dealing in high performance sports, so complex characters Correct. on both sides of the mic, yes. I guess. You yes. know, I mean, I hadn't even clicked in my head that the boxer will have a manager, but the boxer will then have to sign up a promotional company. For the most part, yeah. And then that has to work with some, a boxer with two X's. It's not a promotional company. That's a, what no, is that? That's a, they're, they're a promotional company. Okay. They are uh, a promotional. As it relates to how I describe the market, boxer would be looked at as the promotional company. Sky and NBC Peacock will be looked at as the broadcaster. Mm. Then the boxers are in each one. They each maybe have their own management team. Sometimes the management team is also part of the promotional company, but usually they're pretty separate. So it just depends. And there's some famous managers, of course. I mean, you're not in a you're not in a sport of it's not cricket. You know, no. it's it, this a real aggressive. I mean, it's almost part of it, isn't it? The yeah. heat and stuff. You well, know, again, like, it all circles back to I talked about how quickly the industry moves and how how quickly things change. I mean, when you look at the career of a boxer. And if you look at that boxer as basically being a business that employs X amount of people, whether it be a manager, whether it be a legal team, whether it be a nutritionist or a trainer or a coach or whatever, if that boxer loses a certain fight, the entire thing is derailed. Mm. If they lose two fights, the entire thing is derailed. I mean, Jesus boxing Christ. is one of those sports where your career can end as quickly as it gets started. And it will end other people's careers. And it could end Your other whole team career. behind you. Absolutely. That's how wow. it works. The UFC was such an explosion onto the scene, but it does feel like I'm hearing less about it, Len. I mean, you know, and boxing seems back at the forefront. Is that fair? Is this a sort of, as you say, there's almost a bit of a reignition or reigniting of boxing? Well, I think with combat sports, and I'm, I'm kind of in a unique position because I've been able to announce and MC almost all combat sports, everything from boxing to MMA to bare knuckle to kickboxing to Oh, Muay you've Thai. done them all, have you? I've done, you haven't, I've you haven't got a all. brother doing UFC. No, 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 no. no. I've, been, I've been able to do them all and I like doing them all and I'm a fan of them all, but there's a lot of overlap of fans within the market. Not a ton, not, not completely, but there is a lot of overlap. So when a certain sport or a certain industry can get momentum, for example, boxing has a ton of momentum right now. A lot of big fights are getting made. A lot of the superstars that maybe have been inactive are starting to get active again because there's been an influx of capital into the industry. That then builds momentum for the entire industry. The UFC is- And Saudis in, come in in a big way. Correct. Yeah. And obviously the infusion of capital and money changes a lot mm. of things too. The UFC is almost kind of in a different position because they're trying to identify their next group of stars. The boxing stars that we've been used to have almost kind of reached their- their peak popularity. You have people like Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua in this country. You have people like Canelo in Mexico and South America. You have people like Inoue in Japan and Asia. So we're getting a lot of those superstars that have been built over the past five to 10 years that now are reaching the climax of their career. The UFC is just in a different position when it comes to their life cycle. There, I think they're looking for 
the next Conor McGregor, the next group of stars that can fill those They shoes. find it harder to build stars, don't they? Isn't that fair? There's, there seems to be something in that, that <laughs> no. to build characters or not. I mean, there's the Conor McGregor, but after that, household names, you might run pretty short, which it's, people can probably name 10 it, boxes. It probably, it come, that comes down to geography. Um, I think that in America, maybe you could have some people that could name more UFC stars than boxers because that's just where Amer- UFC has a bigger stake. Oh, really? Yeah. UFC is much bigger than America, is it? Yeah. Uh, well, w- what's interesting is the UFC has accomplished something that very s- few sports accomplish, which is where their business is what the sport is referred to as. So, for example, no one calls football NFL. Mm. No one calls boxing boxer or matchroom or Queensbury, they call it boxing. Yeah. UFC is one of those sports. MMA is one of those sports. I just did it myself. MMA is one of those sports where the UFC is actually what people refer to the entire sport as. Mm. They, they literally control a whole market. The only other sports that I can think of that have done that may be NASCAR, WWE, things like that. And mm. they control the entire market. So it, I think it's just different. I think if you want to be an MMA fighter, if you really want to be a household name, you have to go through the UFC. If you're a boxer and want to be a household name, you actually have five or six different options that you can go, each with their own broadcaster. So I think the UFC's size is what allows them to be a massive platform. But at the same time, they only have one distribution contract, and that's with ESPN, at least as it pertains to to America. Versus if you were looking at boxing in America, you could go with PBC that distributes on Amazon Prime. You could go with Top Rank that distributes on ESPN. You could have a handful of other promotions Mm. that have their own promotional and distribution deals. What I find odd in boxing is you talk about like there's suddenly a load more capital, but there's something about boxing that people always like to watch a boxing fight. So, you know, it's interesting that there's sort of at the moment there's more money. Surely there's always money for a good boxing fight, but I guess it's more about this constant change you're talking about that it, well, it depends. People like to see big stars, you know, people want to see fury and they want to see, you know, whatever they want to see names that are exciting to watch. You and, know? Those, and boxers control their own promotion a lot differently. Mm. Um, so there's, there's just more money that gets demanded. They just want more money for a certain show. A lot of fighters go on a fight by fight basis, especially the bigger names. A lot of them only have maybe one or two fight deals because they know regardless of what happens with this promotional company, they'll still land on their feet and they can still do their own thing with another right, promotional company. Right. A common example of that would be someone like Canelo. The promoter of Canelo's fights, not that it doesn't matter, but ultimately Canelo is the promoter of his own fights because that's how big he is. Yeah. So whether he's signed with this promotional company or that promotional company. But he's become bigger than the thing. Correct, yeah. correct. Yeah, okay. And I guess I guess within that, it's just all their ability to drive the marketing, isn't it? You yeah. know, Lennox Lewis was famously, you know, never got the, the you know, there's some of the greatest boxers ever say, actually, it's one of the most brilliant boxers ever. And yeah. it's hard to watch a fight without being incredibly impressed by him. But he was never interested in the marketing mm-hmm. and never wanted to sort of showboat and all of that. And yeah. it's, it's back to the entertainment, isn't it? For well, Tyson again, Fury's a controversial figure in a way. You true. Know? Like I said, every fight, almost needs to be treated as its own business. Yeah. In the same way that uh, a company would raise funds to operate their business, you need to raise funds, you need to put together advertisers, you need to put together your budget for one show. And then that one show, depending on how big it is, could then fund the next show or the next show or the next show, depending on how it operates. So the boxers then are in a position and the promoters too, and that's why that's why it's called a promotion or a promotional company or a promoter, is it's about driving as much demand for this show as possible. It doesn't matter what the show is three weeks down the road. We need to get through this show first. This show needs to be as big as possible. We need to spin whatever narrative we can to get people impressed and get people involved in the show. We're going to go do a, an open workout in the public to draw public demand to sell the last few tickets. Or we're going to run you know, this boxer or have this you know, commercial run at this point to just drive as much as we can. Because as soon as the clock strikes on Saturday night, there's nothing else that we can do to run this show anymore. It's not like the NFL where the NFL has a set schedule and they know exactly there's going to be 16, 17 weeks in the season. 32 teams are going to be playing. All the teams kind of benefit from each other. You have fandom. You have rivalries for certain teams. Things There's a, there's a bigger, more concrete infrastructure versus boxing where it's it's basically eat what you kill. 
Yeah, God, that's terrifying the way you've got to focus on it. I mean, I, I spent a little too long trying to work in the music industry rather badly, but it taught me a hell of a lot about business because <laughs> it's such a tough industry. I mean, yeah. not not dissimilar to sports. You no. know, there's a lot of a lot of similarities. I mean, that do you feel the same way that what you have learned about the sports industry makes running a makes running a sports startup um, seem easier or is nah. some of those skills transferable at least? Actually, no. I mean, maybe. I think just the overall business acumen that you develop could be transferable. But with as it pertains to me in the boxing industry, I don't work in the industry in the sense of I have one role that I occupy and I almost work more for the network than I do the promotional company. Like I have no involvement. Oh, really? I have no involvement in booking fights or running yeah, the actual sure. business. I'm just I'm just in it to where I know what's going on or I know how the uh. business needs to function. So Sky the, Sports and Boxer have to kind of give you the green tick. They correct. could they could both say, I'm not happy with him anymore. Probably. Yeah. He no, cocked that yeah. guy's name up. Again. Probably. Yeah, yeah. No. And that's so I don't necessarily like I'm not working day to day for boxer running their business. I I don't do that. But I understand what's going on and I work closely enough with it and I'm immersed in it to where I know how the industry operates and I've been around it. So for that reason, there may not be a ton of transferable skills from working in boxing to working in business because my role within boxing is more of an entertainment role than it is actually running the business. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's different. And I mean, you know, you've obviously found confidence in doing this. Are you, where, where do you stem your confidence from originally? <laughs> it's actually a funny question because I grew up remarkably socially awkward, uh, which you wouldn't think doing the job that I do now that I would have been like that. Um, but I grew up in a, in a family of attorneys. My father who <laughs> raised me was an attorney. He was a trial attorney. So he very early on taught me the importance of public speaking. And he also brought me to, you know, meetings that he would go to and things like that. So I got a, a, a general feel and vibe for how people interact in communication. I was actually always better with adults growing up than I was kids. Mm. So that's almost kind of aided me in my ability. Are you, are you an only child or you got brothers and sisters? Uh, I was raised by my father, just by myself. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, okay. And that gives you that sort of experience, isn't it? You yes. sort of get used to chatting to adults a lot Correct. more. And so I became a, a comfortable speaker very early on. And it's always been something I've been good at. So that's just kind of where I think ultimately, I guess the passion or the ability to do it came from. Yeah, that's nice. Cause confidence is a really strange thing. It's a, a slippery creature. You know, you can meet people who are very confident one-to-one, -one, but you stand them in front of people and they fall apart, Correct. you know, and you could get the opposite. They're amazing in front of people. And then you try and talk to them and they're very awkward, they don't really like interaction, you know? Yes. And effectively what you learn from that is they're very different things. You know, one thing of being sort of personable and one-to-one -one with someone is a, is a very different thing than standing up and communicating to a group of people you know i mean what an interesting thing your father he, he must be very proud of you but he must be like wasn't exactly what i had in mind you know i was kind of hoping that you were gonna like yeah. you know? yeah, and and obviously you know i still went the you know i still went a traditional business route and i love business and i think that that's helped me a lot navigate my career also just having a general understanding of how business works it's not like i came into this industry just you know it's it's when I've talked to people that may work in entertainment only, or when I talk to maybe agents or managers, they may be used to someone who's only been immersed in entertainment. They figured out when they could sing when they were 13. And that's kind of the only thing that they pursued for the rest of their life. Mm. I'm kind of in a unique position where I come to the entertainment industry and the sports industry with a background in business to where I kind of understand the underlying principles and the foundations of what I'm being coming a part of now, because everything is a business. Breath is so important. Yeah. I'm now they're trying to imagine a, uh, your father do a law case, you know, <laughs> as a ring announcer, which would be a funny skit, you know, let's get ready. And not, you know, it could be. Well, again, I mean, I think, you know, ring announcing, it's just, it's not that dissimilar from public speaking. It's just the setting that kind of changes in, in your overall tone. But when you think about being a public speaker, whether it's in a courtroom, whether it's giving a business presentation, a lot of the same principles are the same. No, and I've helped teach people and I've coached a couple people on public speaking and I've spoken to groups on public speaking because that's really the core of what I do. It's There's techniques that you can apply to, from announcing into just normal business, understanding cadence, understanding flow, inflection, how to increase volume, how to decrease volume, how to get someone's attention by pausing. Mm. And then waiting to draw them in so I can continue the conversation. There's a lot of the same techniques that you Cadence, can apply. Cadence, what from you both. should go up and down, or yeah, exactly. You don't want to be monotone, and that's what ring announcing is. Knowing how to, 
you know, there's certain words that I can increase my volume for or my exaggeration for because those are the important words, right? Whether if I'm talking about a championship, for example, that would be a word that I would want to draw attention to, not necessarily the word the or things like that. So it's yeah. an understanding crescendos and flow to your voice that helps build that excitement. And build it's rapping, man. It's a form of rapping. Yeah. Rapping music. When I was learning how to do this and when I wanted to become the best I could at it, I didn't just look at ring announcers. I started paying attention to public to other types of public speakers, whether it be stand-up comedians, motivational speakers, even singers and performers, to try to get an idea of, okay, that's how this person builds suspense, or okay, that's how this person draws the audience in, okay, that's how this person quiets the audience down. And you can take inspiration from a handful of different examples that are within the overarching realm of public speaking. It's funny when you say that you need cadence because the monotone thing, you get that thing. I have a very close friend who does this less now, but, and I won't name him, but, and I could think of someone in the business as well. There's something about a monotone, no matter how interesting what that person is actually saying, it just shuts the brain down. The brain's reaction to it is this is not important information. They could literally be saying, you know, I've got a million pounds in a suitcase for you under the table. You're just like, huh? What? Exactly. I've drifted off, mate. So yeah. did you say something to me? But it's fascinating. I mean, I'm, honestly, the friend I'm thinking of, he is a really interesting person, you know, and actually he's better at these days. But God damn it, do you have to concentrate? <laughs> and I just always thought, what is it? But I notice it's like, it's the tone. He keeps his fucking tone. Yes. You know, we look for variation. You yes. know, we, we, it's part of the language is the up and the down and the da, 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 da and the richness to it. And suddenly we're all like, I mean, the pausing you did did with great effect, like, you know, it's like, you know, more space. space well, think about good. if I, so an example that I've used is there's a lot of people that if you asked or if you analyzed how they speak purely from a textbook standpoint of public speaking, you would maybe say that they do certain things that are not good for speaking. So for, I'm going to use an example, Barack Obama, who was a president. He had a very strange cadence to how he spoke. It was very different than a lot of, he would, he would pause and he would drone, he would drain words out. He would hold the last letter of words for an extended period of time. He, it, it, it would almost replace an um or an uh. So he had kind of a weird cadence to how he talked, but it was amazing because it was so unique and he was so distinctly him mm. that it brought the audience in to kind of listen to what he was saying because no one else can speak like Obama. That's why when someone does an Obama impersonation, it's uniquely Barack Obama. It's that because he has a very recognizable way to which he speaks. So it's also about finding something that's unique, that's also palatable for the average person. Well, Churchill is a big example of that. He had yeah. a stutter. He had a really strange way of speaking. Again, it draws you in. There's something yeah. unusual about it. He sort of mumbled a bit. I mean, he, you know, you listen to, you can get the old speak, speeches he did. Well, you can get the digitally probably. I've got them on vinyl. And yeah. I mean, they're fascinating. I mean, really. you can go back and you can listen to speeches that Martin Luther King did. And he, mm. and he was used to speaking to massive crowds of people to get them motivated and get them rising. A lot of the same way that he would talk is a lot of the same way that an MC or a ring announcer would talk. This big inflection and this big, you know, presentation to how he speaks and how he how he builds it up. Yeah, builds it up and adds emphasis. Well, the to very words. famous speech he he did. I was listening to a history of that. They'd been there. He the, the one where he said all men are created equal and all of that. This sort of very famous and apparently it'd been a terrible day with lots yeah. of really boring speakers. Oh yeah, the it, I have a dream speech. Yeah, yeah, the I have a dream. You know, and he ended up freestyling some of it and. You know, he was the he was the last guy. A lot of people had gone home. Everyone was tired. Everything was sort of falling apart. Yeah. And, you know, again, his speaking did come through. I mean, obviously for this country, you know, whatever anyone thinks about anything, mm -hmm. I think it is without denial that Churchill motivated people. As they yeah. said, he sent the English language into battle. It was kind yeah, of like go, go, everyone had given up. You go, know? go listen to a Southern Baptist preacher in the South of America talk about the Bible, right? They get so passionate and they're, and they're so, and they present it in such a way that it's captivating and it really stands out and it's really different. So you'll, you'll see it from industry to industry, whether it's politics, whether it's religion, whether it's movies, whether it's music, you're going to run into people that have this, just this ability to just communicate and in such an innate fashion that's so uniquely them that it makes you want to listen. It can also create the cult though. 
on it. Oh, okay, I mean, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I mean, and actually there's a positive way I'm thinking of that. I'm like um, a very good uh, friend of mine and very, very successful entrepreneur. I won't say who, but he's running a unicorn, but he ran me up and then uh, he was saying, I'm a cult leader, Andy. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? He's like, we did our like away week. And he says, you know, I'm doing these big speeches. He's like, I felt like a cult leader underneath it. You know, and actually underneath it, a company is a culture, is a thing. Yes. They're signing up to your values. You've got to get them motivated. You know, Absolutely. what's Apple? Apple's a religion, Absolutely. you know? Absolutely. And actually your effect, you know, cults are scary because it's scary what you can do to a group of people who are signing up. Because often when you look at these cult leaders, you've got, you know, 200 women, you know, you know, 200 men and God knows what, you know. So you look at the guy and you think like, well, I mean, you know, how's that working out sort of yeah. thing. But then you hear them speak or something and you've got this weird you know, being, you know, maybe something to take from the conversation is, you know, weird is good, you know, yeah. and, and maybe as a business leader, yeah, look, there's a way of talking to someone intimately, but like really understanding how to stand up and speak in the, using these techniques yeah. to get your points across to basically it's that, I don't mean to call your job a trick, but they're tricks of the mind to keep people interested. Yes, absolutely. You well, if you, I mean, at some capacity, everything is sales and, mm. it's, and whether you're selling someone uh, to get involved in what you're doing or whether you're selling someone to get behind a cause that you're behind, it's selling. It's getting them to have the same motivations or to become impassioned about something in the same way that you are. And the way that you can present that is very appealing depending on how good you are at it. So that's why when I talk to, you know, when I've talked to young entrepreneurs or business students or things like that, a lot of them neglect public speaking, but it's not just public speaking, it's communication in general. It's how do you come across on the phone? How do you come across in a meeting? Do you sound interesting? Do you sound engaging? Oh, well, no, I don't. Okay, well, then I'm probably not going to sit there and listen to what you want to sell. I'm not going to sit there and listen it's to the It's hard to switch that, that on because we're all we're on a one-to-one. -one, we're almost uh, getting into what is charm or what is charisma, True. you know. And there's the, deep the, psychological. These are quite yeah. hard. I mean, you could teach someone how to have confidence to stand up in front of people. But charisma, I mean, it's an interesting word. Charisma is... Um, I don't know. Charm will get you a long way. Charm is is more, there's a kindness slightly to charm. Charisma is just being engaging. Like, I don't have to like you. You could be very charismatic, but I still think you're an arsehole. True. Yes, absolutely. Charming means I actually really like you. So actually, if I try, I never really thought about the two words, but charismatic is something that maybe is more of in a public arena and yeah. charm is more in a one-to-one. -one. Interesting. You know, someone has I a, think so. You know, there's, but there's a fine line. It's almost like there's a fine line between arrogance and confidence. Oh my right? God, I think is there a fine, fine line? I think there's a fine line between charisma and charm. It's just kind of different settings, like you said. And actually the British, we have a real issue because it's slightly tall poppy syndrome and stuff. And like we don't like, you know, we just don't like people going on about things. I guess we're just in a little country. We don't want everyone showing <laughs> off or something, but it's a real problem in industry and stuff. You know, I, I still think about it. When I was last in Denver hosting London, um, yeah. you know, I had all these British scientists there all with, you know, well, they were business people, but a lot of them were scientists as well, raising money for amazing life science companies. Mm -hmm. Start there, just like 30 seconds, stand up, be, tell people what you're doing, what you're doing. Oh my gosh, the British were so apologetic. And I was having to retranslate for them. They were sort of getting up and going, well, you know, I don't know. What is that. <laughs> and I was like, this guy wants money. And he said 5 million, but really he needs 50. And he would, and the guy was like, yeah, yeah, that would yeah. be great. <laughs> but you know, there's a real, like I always feel if I put it in a nice way, I feel Britain and America kind of needs each other. In fact, standing there watching this meeting of minds, there was some, in that example is a good example. There were some brilliant scientists coming out of Oxford and Cambridge with, you know, beautiful, amazing things they're coming out of and they struggle to commercialize them but you go to somewhere like denver that's open and welcoming and not like new york like i love new york but not like what do you want you know it's like they were like prepared to listen and you could see almost the arms going around you know there's this huge community of expats of aussies and brits in denver and there's that sort of welcoming like we need the americas we need your showmanship <laughs> we need it we need it for boxer yeah. like you know and actually what's quite sweet for us is you find us quite endearing as opposed to you know I like agree. really annoying you yeah. know I would agree. Which you could. Maybe you should. So like one more question, which in before we move on to a bit of fun, but um, yeah. is there anything um, do you feel that going on at the moment? I mean, you, don't worry if I haven't had time to think about this. We can leave it. But anything that's going on and that's not being talked about in the press, you know, there's 
there's a lot of subjects we find these days that, you know, um, a lot of the press narrative is kind of missing the point, you know. So, you know, um, there's, there's numerous examples. But, you know, in this country, I would say we don't talk about legalizing marijuana because apparently we can't and everyone thinks it's terribly taboo. Or, you know, we don't talk about, um, you know, really what's happening in certain industries. Is there any of those subjects that you think should be aired that are not being chatted about in the press? Um, I think maybe within boxing, there could be conversations as it comes to innovating with your show and your presentation. Um, I think that, and that's something that I focus on. And that's a big, big reason why I like working with sky is again, I can only speak on the entertainment side more than I can the actual business Mm. of boxing. But I think being able to present your show right now, I think one thing that's complex right now with boxing is there's a lot of different providers of content and entertainment. Um, and ultimately, and I've, I've talked about this before, but if you were to ask a promotional company who your biggest competitor is, they would list off the other promotional companies. If you were to ask Boxer, they would likely say Matchroom or Queensbury. If you ask Queensbury, they'd say Matchroom, Boxer. You know, it would be the other promotional companies. In actuality, the competition that we have is any other form of entertainment that someone could engage in that isn't our show. When I turn on the television and I can watch one thing, I can turn to boxing or I can turn to a hundred other options. And that's just on my television. That's assuming I even want to watch TV. So I think that there's a, there's a big competition now as it relates to how can we create our product in a captivating way that will make someone want to sit down and watch a four hour broadcast. Cause right now boxing has a difficulty where they get a huge influx and a huge surge of people that want to watch the main event, but the underlying show, the undercard doesn't always rope as many consumers mm. and viewers in. So I think there needs to be a conversation a lot on innovating the product and see how you can improve the product from a presentation standpoint, because you can't change the fights. You can't change the rules. You can't change the way that a boxer's career progresses. You can't change the titles that they compete for or anything like that. But what you can do is you can edit and you can adjust and you can frame the show in a captivating way that may want to bring somebody in. So I would love to see maybe more conversations around that. Yeah, I find with boxing, I don't know whether you can really enjoy it unless you've ever tried boxing even for 10 minutes, you know? I wonder how much of the audience have never done any combat sports. Like, there's a sort of element at which uh, your enjoyment, certainly mine changed a lot from just trying to box briefly. I actually, I, I would actually say that combat sports probably has one of the easiest ways to bring in a casual fan. Oh. Because when you think about it, at its core fighting is actually a rather simplistic sport. Mm. Yes, there's a lot of nuance to it, but in terms of innately understanding it from a casual viewer, I actually think it's easier to understand than a football game. If you don't know certain rules, you know why they're even trying to accomplish what they're trying to do. At least with boxing, with it being one-on-one and it being a fight, you generally understand what one person is trying to do. You can explain it in a sentence. He's trying to knock him out. Correct. And I think that's, if we can get towards maybe that a little bit more, I think that we can bring in a higher percentage of casual viewers. I think that is something that sometimes combat sports struggles with is not only bringing in casual viewers, but also keeping them there beyond their interest for just one fight or beyond their interest for just one fighter. So we're just going to have a bit of fun now, mate, with a couple of, a uh, couple of uh, uh, easier bits. Let's uh, do it. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Um, you should know the answer. Very easy questions. Answer as quickly as you can, just to get to know you a little far better. Um, D is queuing some music and we're off. What was your first job? My first job is I worked at Chipotle Mexican Grill. I was a line cook and a cashier. Oh, nice. And for the Brits, that's the Mexican uh, Chipotle. I think there's some in London, vaguely, yeah. with oh, shit yeah. in Mexican food. There's a lot of Chipotles here. Oh, is there? Yeah, yeah. And your worst job? Ooh. Um, so even though I grew up wanting to be a chef and wanting to be a cook, I worked in a fine dining kitchen one summer. Um, and I was actually one of the few cooks on staff, one of the few prep cooks that didn't go to culinary school. So I was already kind of behind the, behind the eight ball, such a stressful job. Um, the people that work in kitchens and work in restaurants that have to prep that amount of food and they have to be on it for a short period of time, you know, it's, it's, it's an incredibly hectic industry, respect to the people that do it. But that job was hell. I'm not I, I don't it. understand how people do it. It's amazing. I, I live with one. It's so difficult. You're in some basement. Yeah, you've got to chop. Uh, not just, I get annoyed chopping one cucumber and a tomato. It's like a thousand. And it's also it's also just remembering so many different things that are going on. You're working on so many different projects together because you can get one thing in the oven and then you can work on something else. You can prep this while this thing is chilling or whatever you have to do. So there's a ton of multitasking that goes on. And there's a lot of individual work, but there's also a lot of teamwork. And it's, it's 
Why do you, what do you think motivates people? Because then I'm like, you don't even get the credit. I think it's just creating something. Mm. I think a lot of people get a sense of you. And that's why I like to cook. It's just not, I like to cook that much. But that's why I like to cook is because you get that sense of euphoria when you create something or make something for someone else. So some people- You've got to be for that. someone else. Yes. I, I'm not, I don't enjoy it when I cook for myself. I just always <laughs> think, I should have had a turkey sandwich. I always just get carried away and add too much crap to it. Just yeah. think, you know. Could be. Uh, favorite subject at school? Growing up, I would say it was mathematics. I loved arithmetic growing up. Um, and then as I got older, business, obviously, as I pursued that in high school and college. Okay, that's a subject. Yeah, I'm too old. <laughs> they never had it as a subject when I was in school. Uh, what's your special skill? Uh, ooh, I mean, I guess ring announcing is somewhat of a special skill. I was in the band growing up, played the saxophone. Oh, do you? Uh, I don't and it don't much anymore, but I could probably remember it. And Oh, nice, nice. Oh, well, we should have, we should have known. We should have done this on Thursday. We, have, <laughs> we, we have a little jam after work. Oh, very cool. Yeah, very nice. Um, what did you want to be when you grew up? A chef, you Yeah, said. a chef I wanted to grow up to be. Uh, that's kind of what I was interested in when I was like a Until teenager. that job. Honestly, kind of, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, would say, I would say that's fair. And what did your parents want you to be? Uh, my dad was very... My, one of my dad's best qualities as a parent is he was very into what I were, whatever I was into. So he was very supportive regardless of what I wanted to pursue, um, which I think is one of the most important things a parent can be for their kid. So I don't think he had any predisposition of what he wanted me to be. Um, maybe a lawyer, because that's what he did, but I don't even think that he really wanted me to pursue that. He just wanted me to follow whatever I was. Is he still around your dad? He is, yeah, he's yeah, a bit pick older. him up, what's hey, his name? His name is Robert, he goes by Bob. Bob, big up Bob. Uh, you've done a yes. tremendous job, mate. It sounds like you Thank work you. very hard. So as, 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 a, as a parent, I understand that. I mean, uh, it, also people who are good in court, they're good at debating. That yes. must've been quite frustrating as a young man. I love the debate. Some of my friends hate me for that, but I love the debate. Some of my friends love the debate and I've been in very heated arguments with yeah. them, but it's never personal. So yeah, I was always raised how to debate and things like that. My dad, he was a very logical person, is a very logical person. So that's how he taught me to think. And he and those traits have passed down to me. But I get sometimes flack working in my company. I almost like to take things from the devil's advocate pers perspective. Oh, me too. When I'm, when I'm ever handed an idea or handed a concept, the first thing I do is I try to poke as many holes into it as I can. Some people like that. Some people really hate when I do that. But what that allows me to do is that's really how I wrap my head around concepts and really get interested and get involved in them is by being able to sit here and say everything that's wrong with it. And then if I can patch those holes, then that, you know, can ultimately become a good idea that can flourish. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, I feel devil's advocate is such an important thing to, to do. And as you say, people get frustrated with it, but I don't think there's enough debate out there now. I mean, people are, you know, debate is seen as arguing or it's seen. Yes, I agree. I don't know. I mean, it's, um, yeah, if we're not if we're not going to debate, we're not going to find the edges. People get so angry that you would even engage in a debate. Obviously, when you get into, you know, politics or any type of sensitive subject, obviously, then maybe handling a debate is different. But as it pertains to business, and I've had this conversation with the people that I work with, and it's never personal. If we're trying to pursue a goal and we're all on the same team here, we would be foolish not to flush out every idea that we can. Now, don't take it as that I'm just, you know, putting down your idea or saying it's bad. I like to give reasons why I don't think it could work or why I don't think it's as efficient or why I don't think it could yield the result that you think it could be. But it's never personal. It's never an attack. It's never an argument. Like you said, there's a difference between arguing and debating. I think debating is ultimately... I mean, yes, you want to win a debate, but in the process, you may actually gain common ground and you may actually, the other person may hear your perspective and go, oh, actually, I kind of agree with that more or vice versa. What's your go-to karaoke song? Ooh, that's a great question. Uh, Pour Some Sugar On Me by Def Leppard. British band, very yes. good, mate. Well done, <laughs> excellent work. And um, I feel, you know, uh, I mean, Fury has a little sing along. I mean, a ring yeah. announcer is not allowed to sing along now and then. Uh, you don't want to hear me sing. Okay, I can, I can announce, but I can't sing. Don't know why. I just wasn't given that that gift. I guess. Uh, office dogs, business or bullshit? Mm. Don't worry, you can be honest. I don't like them. You don't like them. I don't like them. D distracting. I, more often than not, yes. I've, I've, I know people that really benefit by having their dog there and it actually helps them. Great, by all means. I think a lot of people maybe pretend that because they just want to have their dog around them, which is fine. But 
I'd say it's about 80% bullshit. I would agree. I mean, the truth is, <laughs> Romeo, I love you very much, but you don't really help oh, me I'm out. I'm going to piss off people no, who love dogs. Well, well, <laughs> luckily, my dog, A, doesn't speak English, and B, doesn't give a fuck about anything, really. He's so chilled out. So, you know, he won't be grabbing your ankles on the way out. That's good. Uh, have you ever been fired? Mm. No. Well, you better work on that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just cock up a few names on stage and then you can tick it off the list. Your yeah. life is fulfilled. You yeah, know? I think I was close to getting fired from Chipotle very early on when I made a pretty key mistake, but that was about it, I think. What did you do? Surf, surf margaritas to no, alcoholics? That was, it was a time where I was training to learn the register and there's a lot of, at the end of the day, you have to do accounting for everything that's in the drawer and things like that. And that's actually, it's a very nuanced process, or at least it was where I worked, which is a good thing. Because they want to limit, you know, extortion or taking mm, money, mm. which totally understandable. And I was, and I must have misplaced something somewhere. And I don't know if I accounted something wrong or missed a payment, but I was pretty far off. And they were like, "Hey, that's okay." I think, it and almost, you had to make good your own and pay pay, pay pay the week's wages. Yeah. Almost, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, have you got a vice? What's your vice? Oh, I like to go out. I li I believe in uh, I believe in out out you mean like yeah, British out partying yeah I like to I like to go out and be social and and meet people and and be in social environments and go out and have a drink I enjoy that extrovert yeah I think so up to a certain extent this is our favorite part of the show the business or bullshit quiz Ooh, okay. um, pass me the box D grab a paddle uh, you need to hold this up and say business or bullshit because we're on the radio as well as on the TV. Sure, I got them right. Okay, we're good. Okay. Uh, I'm going to name a series of terms or phrases to be used in business. And you this. have to tell you, Miss, whether yes. you think it is business or bullshit. And we may have a little debate about it. Depending. Okay. Um, Love let me it. Just organize myself mildly. Uh, let me have a look. Some of these may not be. Oh, there we go. Personal trainers. Mm. I would say. <sighs> Bullshit. It's really, it's really 50, 50, to be honest with you. Um, I would say it's, I'm going to go 50, 50. I don't know if that's a loud answer. I'm going to go 50, not allowed. 50. Come on, let's pick one. All right. I will go mostly business. I okay. do think personal trainers as a whole. Yes. I, I think it's business. Yeah. Yeah. What about, um, what, because it keeps you healthy and you know, I think as a general rule, a lot of fitness is really getting going more than anything else. And also staying consistent when you're in it. Um, I'm on a fitness journey. I, I've lost about 100 pounds. I used to be way bigger when I played football. So I've gone through my own fitness journey. A lot of it is getting started, but also staying committed and personal trainers can help. Getting with that. going in a fitness journey rather than getting going in the morning. Yes, yeah, going, yeah, yeah. getting going in a fitness journey and having a clear goal and having a clear pathway to get there. I think a lot of people don't know how to do it. They can find out on their own, but that is that is something that personal trainers can help them do. And for that reason, I would say it's mostly business. Yeah, the, the power of a third party getting you to do something. I mean, you could say something to your best friend a thousand times and a, a stranger tells them once and they're like, it's very strange that our sort of need to like, I think what it's about, I was thinking the other day, what's it about? I was thinking, we don't like the idea. Our, our best friend knows us. They already know I'm an arsehole. Right. You know, whereas a stranger, I'm trying to be, pretend that I'm mm -hmm. this better person than I really Agreed. am. I think so. So someone comes along and said, oh, you really need to do that, Andrew. I don't, first impressions matter. I don't want to be the guy who didn't do it and just was lazy <laughs> or whatever. I agree. You know, anyway, corporate gifting. Do you get any nice gifts? You got any uh, special microphones or something? I like, I like giving gifts. I hate receiving them. Oh, that's Cor controversial. Corporate gifting. Uh, I think sometimes it's very fake. Yeah. I think sometimes it's very much like I want to give you a gift because I think it's, you know, X, Y, Z in this situation. So I'm going to go mostly bullshit for corporate mm. gifting, but I do think there's a lot of sincerity that goes on with it too, depending on the party. Difficult as a professional, bit of a hot topic in our news at the moment because the uh, prime minister and people have been receiving a lot of what would be <laughs> in my world be considered a bribe because of the value True. And, I, and, and I'd have to give it back. But actually it turns out for MPs, they just need to tell each other that they got like a 30 grand watch or whatever. <laughs> and then that's cool. And that works. Yeah, that works. Yeah, yeah. So I wish it would work like that here. I remember actually it happened here years ago where a client gave someone something very expensive and they didn't click. They were so in the moment, they were showing me this watch and I was going like, I can't accept that, you know? And they're going, no, no, it's wicked. Don't you see? And I was like, oh, you're gonna have to give that back. And then I saw it dawn on them and he's like, Oh my God, I've got to give it back. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, yeah, you yeah. can't accept it. And yeah. he was like, 
fuck. And I was like, I was like, I was so happy about it. And I was like, yeah, man, greed is good, you know. Yeah. Um, business accelerators, you in any of those? Uh, well, I, I think, what's the definition of business oh, accelerator? Well, that, who knows, frankly, but basically your business could go into something in London or in America and they wrap a load of people around you. They might put a bit of money in and they go, come on, it'd be like be like a personal trainer for a business. Oh, are you talking like like an incubator? Incubator. Okay, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I no, mean, they're I, all slightly different, but. Um, I'm going to go business. I do think that, that, that there are situations where that could certainly be helpful and help businesses kind of get off the ground. Uh, seeing as the election's coming up, I don't really know what this means either. Right wing, is that business or bullshit? Business, I think right wing, left wing, I think both both sides are correct. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer when it comes to politics or a system of government. Uh, okay, very good, I like that. Let's find some, um, <laughs> some, some might be more controversial. Yeah. Um, you aware of this concept, universal basic income? So yeah, this is the concept, I, I everyone get gets a bit of money. Yeah, I, I get it. Um, I would say bullshit for me. I don't. I don't agree with it. I, I like having. I don't know. It's that one's tough to. T I think it's putting that on a card. I'm not 100 percent sure. I think there's none of these. These are all unfair. I don't know. I think no. I think that there needs to be a situation where you can kind of produce your own and, and build what you want to build. This I blame the Californians for. But lunch <laughs> provided for employees. Um, it's become a. It's become like a space race of how much food you can provide. I think it's bullshit. I, I don't know. Do you I get lunch know. as a ring announcer? Nah, nah. Sometimes there's catering for a show, depending on if I'm. You'd have to have think about night. what to have. Don't have nuts. Yeah, exactly. It really clogs up the throat. True, doesn't good point. It? Yeah, dairy too. Same thing. Yeah, dairy. Does dairy clog up the throat? Yeah, it produces. It helps produce mucus, which is a problem. You don't want a whole lot of mucus. <clears throat> yeah. What happens if you get a cold just before the announcement? Don't put that evil on. Oh, sorry. Okay, I have a show this one. weekend. Don't jinx it now. Okay. Okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, search engine optimization. Oh, yeah. That's business for sure. I mean, Absolutely. that happens, doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. And how about uh, family business? Business. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Would you ever, um, I mean, you, you, the quite a lot of the boxing community and families. I Certainly. Of some. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think family businesses are great. And as a, as a young man, if I may call you that, personal pronouns, where are you on the um, oh, he, man. she, it, they? As it pertains to business, look, I think whatever can get people comfortable enough to want to engage in a setting, I think that we should respect because the purpose of us being there is for business. So if there's a situation where a pronoun makes someone more comfortable and that helps them actually conduct business, then I'm totally fine for it either way. Quite complicated to remember, I guess, isn't it? Certainly. But, um, but yeah, it's an uh, ever-changing world, as you say. Ethereum, you aware of Ethereum? That, so I think that's, that is business. I think a lot of crypto is bullshit, a lot. Um, Bitcoin, do you think bullshit? I think Bitcoin and Ethereum are probably the most applicable and probably the most business. Uh, the technologies behind behind crypto and blockchain, I'm all for, but I think the majority of crypto is bullshit. Um, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think, unfortunately, it's not creating anything a lot of the time, which is a sad bit. Um, digital nomads, Americans don't do this as much as everyone else, I don't uh, think. Well, no, they do. I, I know, I know a couple of digital nomads. Yeah. I'm all for that if your business is really can be conducted from wherever you want. If your business is purely on the internet and you want to go live in Thailand and you can do your business and still produce value for people that want to pay you, go right ahead. Business, do it. Yeah. Drinking at lunch, something we like. I would say bullshit. Um, I don't know. I don't like to get, I personally don't like to get inebriated when I do business, even if it's on a little level. I, I like to, now for some people it may work, maybe it loosens them up. Maybe I just don't need loosening up. That could be it. But I don't drink when I do business now, for the most part, not think, during the day at least. I think most people feel like that. It's rather disappointing to be honest. <laughs> uh, a group who do drink while working in this country, lawyers. I grew up in a family of lawyers. That Very would be business. business. Very nice. Uh, yeah. How about regulators? There's quite a few of them knocking around. Regulators. Um, regulators, people who, um, oh, I don't know what the American word is. I assume it's the same. You know, uh, there's boxing regulators who decide. Oh, you like, know. like. Okay, I regulate. Okay, yeah, business. You need regulation. You need. You need. Do you the feel system. there's too much regulation in boxing, or not enough? Uh, depends on the topic. Um, I think in some areas of boxing there is enough regulation, but on others, I think there needs to be more. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not exactly clear. The rules are very old in boxing, really, aren't they? You know. Yeah. I mean, some rules have changed over time, but yeah, and I think that that's actually one of the things that keeps the sport pretty good is the history behind it and keeping a lot of the rules the same. Personally.
I don't know how many people have ever died in uh, boxing. I mean, that's an awful thing to ask, but people must have died, you know. I couldn't tell you the number, but I know there have been. Have you ever seen it happen? No. No, no I don't want to. I mean, no, nobody wants to. Yeah, I don't mean to sound like I'm encouraging it, but that's the point that you often regulation would kick in again, wouldn't it? Yes. You know, someone would be like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? Why, you know, I mean, there's, there's that edge to it that it's all, always possible. I agree. Uh, let me find a couple more. Yeah, yeah, I like uh, it. How about Christmas ads, Super Bowl ads? Oh, absolutely business. And what, explain to us the Super well, Bowl thing, Jig. So Super Bowl ads is, is a bit different. So I work in advertising, so I go down a whole rabbit hole of it. But really, Christmas ads and Super Bowl ads, what that just comes down to is an ability to reach a massive audience of people at one time. That's mm. why Super Bowl ads are so expensive for 60 or 90 seconds. I think it's like, I don't know, I think 90 seconds of the Super Bowl is like $5 million or something crazy like that. Wow. But when you think about companies that need to do mass branding, like brand like a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi, they would greatly benefit from that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they the the Super Bowl thing that's been building up, hasn't it? It's sort of been getting more and more ostentatious every year. Oh, it? yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a so it's show. a halftime show. Is like there's a long gap at halftime. Yes, it's what someone show. was saying is the difference between a British sport, sport and American sport. It's like in all the gaps in America, there's like people run on the pitch, things are happening, yes. things are exploding. Whereas we're all like, mm, another cup of tea. Yeah, <laughs> you guys are at the bar. <laughs> yeah, we go to the bar a lot. Exactly. That's our way of dealing with almost. Everything. Everything. <laughs> um, there's still a couple more. Ooh, where are you as a uh, American on Brexit? Don't know enough about it. Okay. I would say that's a good one. Uh, climate change. Uh, that's pass. <laughs> I'm gonna pass on that one. Instagram. That's business. Yeah. yeah. Did you what? What was your main thing you built up your following on when you did uh, social media? Instagram and TikTok because I'm a, my job is really content based, so that makes more sense than utilizing Twitter or X. Uh, just because I need to get videos out there, or pictures out there, or kind of tell my story visually. So Instagram and TikTok typically work better for that than yeah. the others. And uh, workplace humor. How important it is to be making jokes at work? I would say that's really important. Yes. Um, up to obviously a certain extent, but I do think that's important to keep it lighthearted. I think that workplaces can be very stressful at times and that's why I think people can take things so personal. So I think if there's ways to lower that stress level, whether that's a good joke here and there, but sometimes you run the risk of pissing somebody off. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's the risk, but. <laughs> do you think, um, in your opinion, do you think people, I mean, this is a ridiculous question. So you literally, whatever you say is more right than the question, but do you think people are more sensitive in America than, than they are here or more sensitive here? Yeah. They're more sensitive in America, I'd say. Okay. You have to be more careful about what you say there. Well, than you. In America, you have 360 million people and we're a giant melting pot of cultures. Mm. So I don't necessarily think that people are any more, you know, uh, fragile to certain things. I just think that you have such a, such a mix that you just run a great risk of pissing somebody off. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Cause weirdly, um, is that what defines it? Possibly, possibly, you know, that would suggest there would be less humor in London in a way. Cause I mean, London's the only place that's like places like in America, you know, um, like a friend who's uh, grew up in New York when he, he moved here, when he, I mean, he'd come here a few times, but I remember him saying that it's like, well, for the weird thing for me, Andy was to go to another, I was like, oh, New York is the most multicultural place in the world. And I come here and it was the same, yeah. you know? Um, I don't know, in a weird way that breeds tolerance, but I would agree, I agree with you possibly on a global stage, especially if people are, are not all living together, then it could go I also, wrong. I, I mean, I may be the wrong person to ask. I don't take things very personal, even when there are attacks on myself. I just, I don't know, I've, I've always had thick skin, so. We'll do two more or something. Yeah. Uh, lobbying. Uh, I mean, a bit I, of a big thing in America. <laughs> people talk a bit badly of it. I think corporate lobbying definitely gets out of hand for sure. Um, and I think it sometimes gets in the way of passing applicable laws and things that are best for the American people on both sides of the coin. So that's not a Republican or Democratic stance. I just think that sometimes lobbying, you throw enough money at something, you can kind of get anyone behind you. So I don't know. And we'll end on this bombshell. Uh, Chat GPT, where are you on that as a marketeer? Uh, I like it. I, I would say business for sure. Um, I think that AI is something that we're still incredibly new in and I hope that we are careful with but I think AI can be an amazing tool. Um, I like AI, but I also think how you need to think for AI to work. So the difference is, is the, the previous digital age that we were in was all about access to information. Now information is accessible everywhere. 
What AI and ChatGPT basically has changed it to now is focusing on the right question to ask because the, all the information's out there. It's more efficient for a bot to be able to go and find that information. So you actually now as the person, it changes instead of knowing how to find the information, because before it was, I know how to go to a library. I know how to go to read an encyclopedia. I know how to search on the internet. I know how to find the information and then I can digest it on my own. What AI has now changed is, okay, everything's out there. What do I want to know? And can I ask the appropriate question to help mm. me get there? It's all about the prompts now. Yes. And actually it took us all a while to get good at Google, didn't it? Of course. Understanding how to do it. Yes. And I remember discovering Google because when there's other search engines around that were whack, and then someone said, oh, have you heard of this Google one? It actually finds you what you want. So I think that's a very you know neat way you've summarized it, actually. Um, and I guess it's going to take it's going to take a lot of practice to get good at the prompt. I mean, it reminds me of a site here. I don't know if it was American as well. Ask Jeeves. Ask Jeeves. Do you remember, yeah, Ask, remember Jeeves? Ask Jeeves? That was like a big deal because yeah. you could write an English language question. You know, what is Correct. it was almost like an early version of the prompt. You yeah, know? no, it, it was. It's just it was it was way premature. They were, yeah. way they were way ahead of their time. They were way ahead of their time. And actually, now we come to say it, ChatGPT should be called Jeeves. We'd all be much more comfortable okay. with it. And I kind of like that. Possibly with a British accent. And yeah. then, you know, some sense of sensibility. Yeah. On that bombshell. Um, <laughs> no, you've been you've been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so Thank much, you. Cody. Um, people can find you, I guess. Your website's Big Mo. Uh, yeah, you can go to thisisbigmo.com. But I, what I tell people is just to follow me on social media. That's where I post pretty much everything. So follow me on Instagram or TikTok or Facebook or X or whatever you want. I try to engage with everyone. So feel free to reach out and send me a question or send me a message. I like talking to people. Beautiful. Thank you, Cody. You've been brilliant. Thank you. Um, so this was this week's episode of Business Without Bullshit. Thank you, D. Thank you, Cody. Thanks, Rhymes, for doing nothing. It's ciao.